Well, I was looking at the calendar today, and it dawned on me that uh, this coming Saturday, December 7th, the uh, anniversary of the Pearl Harbor bombing, and uh, I know several of you folks have been there and seen it. I know you probably have been from Hawaii, right? You've been to the Pearl Harbor, to the to the, the famous ship in the middle there and all that. Brother Charlie's been there. Him and Joy went years ago and <clears throat> went to Hawaii and all that. It'd be pretty amazing. I, I'd love to see it. I have not been able to do that. Maybe before I pass away, I'll be able to do that. I'm a, I love to... I love to learn about World War II. It's just fascinating to me the how it happened and what happened and and the, I mean everything that's happened to us since is a result of all the things that went on during that time frame and and that made America great, made us who we are, made our economy, made our made our military, made us who we are. They, they, we didn't even have an air force. We had the Army Air Corps that became the Air Force later. And uh, all kinds of different things that happened during that time. Well, believe it or not, <clears throat> this coming Saturday will have been 78 years already. And I've, I've read stories that there's actually some people out there that are like 102, 103 years old that were there during that time. And I'm thinking, wow, it's just actually they're getting fewer and fewer and fewer. And, uh, actually, uh, j just... Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, we had three World War II veterans here in our congregation. And, of course, they're passed away now. <clears throat> but they're getting fewer and fewer and fewer and uh, far between. But uh, I'd like to preach tonight a little bit, kind of remembering a little bit about Pearl Harbor, just a little bit, and uh, talk to you about <clears throat> another people in the Bible that were very unprepared for a battle that was about to happen unprepared and they were caught off guard and and just like they were at Pearl Harbor and they just were they just they couldn't believe that the Japanese would ever do anything like that it just wasn't wasn't possible but yet they did it take your bibles tonight the book of first samuel in the old testament first samuel chapter 13 <clears throat> i'd like to preach a message entitled a people unprepared for battle a people unprepared for battle in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 17. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> just before we read the passage of Scripture, uh, bear with me for just a minute. I'll just set the table here. Uh, when the sun rose over Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, it seemed like the most unlikeliest place in the world to start a war. Beautiful place, just a gorgeous place. Weather was perfect, light wind, breeze, cool temperature, blue skies, and puffy clouds. The birds had begun to fill the morning air with the songs given them by their creator. Families had begun to get ready for morning church services and Sailors had prepared for what they believed would be another routine day at the yard. But abruptly at 7.55, 190 attacking Japanese warplanes shattered the picturesque morning sky. Using the art of surprised perfection, six, count them, six aircraft carriers had moved within striking distance of America's South Pacific fleet out in the Pacific. In a superbly coordinated attack, wave after wave of Japanese planes strafed and bombed the harbor and the airfield. Supporting them were a number of two-man subs that had silently entered into the harbor. When the attack was completed, 2,330 American servicemen lay dead or dying. Another 1,145 had been wounded. Five battleships lay on the bottom of the harbor. 
Two destroyers have been reduced, reduced to gutted hulks. A third was badly crippled. Many other warships were severely damaged and the airfield was absolutely destroyed. We hate it, but the Japanese had found a people unprepared for battle. By the time the American forces realized that they were under attack, they were already crippled. As the last Japanese plane disappeared over the horizon, they left behind a fleet that had been effectively destroyed. As Christians, tonight, we have an enemy that is no less ruthless or cunning. Every day he executes carefully crafted plans aimed at our destruction. Throughout the centuries, he has launched countless Pearl Harbor-style attacks aimed at crippling the Church of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 2.11 it says, We are not to be ignorant of his devices. And yet, so many times, we are a people unprepared for battle. In the Old Testament now, in the book of 1 Samuel, Chapter 13, King Saul is in his capital and he thinks that he's invincible and he doesn't think that anybody would ever go against him because he was God's man and God's first king and yet the Philistines had set them up and made them comfortable and, and was going to come in there and they were going to, they were going to really make a mess of things. Follow along with me as we read in verse 17, and I will point out some things to you of what the Philistines did that would uh, later on enable them to, to, to just kill so many uh, Israelites and uh, almost just about win the, the entire battle. In verse 17, and the spoilers came out of the camp <coughs> of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned unto the way that leaded to Ophrah, unto the land of Shual. And another company turned the way to Beth Horon. Another company turned to the way of the border that looked to the valley of Zeboim, toward the wilderness. Now there was no smith. Now here, wait a minute. This is the blacksmith. Now look, look at this now. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords for spears. So they, what they did, they were smart. They got rid of all the blacksmiths so that the Israelites could not arm themselves. Kind of like Democrats want to come and get all of our guns. Amen? And uh, take that away from us and uh, make us defenseless. Well, that's what they did. And so, so that the Israelites could not make weapons so then later on they would come back and they would do what they were about to do. <clears throat> so, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, his coulter, his axe, and his mattock, anything he could find in the barn. Anything he could find in the barn, he took it down to get it sharpened because they knew they needed some weapons. Yet they <coughs> had a file for the mattocks, the cultures, for the forks, the axes, and he sharpened the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son, was there, there was two swords in the whole land. Only one belonged to Saul and one belonged to Jonathan. That's all there was, man. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. Now, <clears throat> it's a people who got set up and they were absolutely unprepared for what was about to happen. Sometimes I think that in our, in our Christian lives and in our Christian churches, we get hit over the head we don't see it coming, and the devil sets us up, and we're a people unprepared for the battle that's coming. There's a battle that's coming. The devil is coming. By the way, he's already been here. Amen? 
And uh, he hates the church. He hates this church. And he hates any church that tries to do right to teach people the Lord Jesus Christ all about him and how to get saved and, and evangelize and to support missionaries and, and do all the things that we try to do right here. He's been trying to shut this church down for many, many, many years now. And only through the, the grace of God and through the, the work and the blood and the sweat and tears of the people of the Victory Baptist Church, as this church continued to move forward over all this 40 and 3 years. Amen. And so we're, we're very glad that we're still here and be able to say that tonight. But you have to be careful not to be a people unprepared for battle. This is they were at Pearl Harbor that day. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to preach the Word of God one more time tonight at this holy desk in this holy church. Thank you for those that have come out, Lord. I pray that it be a blessing to them as we uh, parse the Scriptures and hide them in our heart tonight. Lord, I pray that you bless everything that's said and done. And from this point on, Lord, hide me behind your cross. And I pray that I'll be a special blessing to all that have gathered here tonight. I pray a special prayer of, of uh, safety and uh, for our missionaries that are about to embark on the next phase of their ministry and go back to Kenya. Lord, we pray that your hand of blessing would be continue to be upon them. Lord, to keep them safe in all that they do in the days ahead. Everything will go well and that they'll be able to get there with not too much trouble and all their plans will come together just as they are trying to get them to do. Lord, now we pray these things in your precious and most wonderful name. Amen. I believe tonight that there are at least four strategies <coughs> that Satan employs in his attack against Christianity. Number one. First of all, he will try to disarm us, to strip us of our power. Number two, he will try to distract us, to lead us from our purpose. Number three, he will try to disable us, to impair us from our productivity. And number four, he will, not only will he, he won't be content with that. We just heard us just a terrible thing, but he won't be content with that. And then fourthly, he will want to destroy us to completely neutralize us so that we will never rise up ever again. The first is illustrated by our text. As we pick up the story, Saul is in his second year as king over Israel. Things could not be going much worse. The Philistines were camped just four miles from Saul's capital in Gibeah. According to verse 5, their army included, if you go to uh, chapter 14, uh, 13, verse 5, <coughs> their army included 30,000 chariots, 6,000 mounted cavalry, a large host of infantry. Saul had only been able to gather 3,000 ragtag men together, and when they started counting the tents in the Philistine camp, over two-thirds of Saul's men, <laughs> they ran. <laughs> they said, we don't, that's too many tents. <laughs> I don't want to die tonight. I'm, <laughs> we're just, we're just going to go home with Ma and Paul, amen. I'm, I'm out of here. To make matters worse, Saul's army was so absurdly outgunned, and the entire Israeli army was found two swords, one for Saul and one for Jonathan. The remainder of the army was armed with clubs, farming tools, mattocks, axes, and things like that. And the reason for that is we know that in the scripture, we, the scriptures tell us that the Philistines had disarmed the people of God. You got to write that down because the, the, that's what the devil wants to do to us tonight. 
He wants to neuter God's people. He wants to disarm God's people. He wants to disarm the local church. He wants you to just sit here and just, uh, whether it's us for no more mentality, to not get anything done, not to see anybody get saved, not to see uh, souls won and people added to the kingdom, not for people to get right with God, not for marriages to get better, not for children to learn about the Lord. He hates the church. He hates everything we do. He wants to disarm us tonight. Amen. I'm convinced that Satan has used this strategy against the church for years. Paul mentions the weapons of our warfare in 2 Corinthians 10.4. And when Jesus Christ organized his church, he equipped us for the battle. He gave us everything we need. He didn't leave us powerless. He armed us for the conflict. Amen. And so, but many today have allowed the devil to strip Strip us of our weapons, leaving us to fight our spiritual battles with inferior arms. So number one tonight, Satan wants to disarm us, to strip us of all our power. Amen? That's what he wants. It's, it's a, by the way, it's a descending staircase. I mean, he want, that's the first thing he wants to do. That's not the only thing he wants to do. Let's just start where he wants to start. He has nullified the message of the gospel in Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God under salvation <clears throat> to everyone that believes it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Bible is amazingly consistent in its presentation of what it's required to be to be saved. Amen? There are certain things that you have to do to get saved. Believing has always been the one requirement of salvation. If you believe, you need to believe. The requirement is the same whether you find it in the Old Testament or the New Testament. It's simple, right? Can I tell you tonight that the world doesn't like that? They want to add things to salvation. They want to take things away from salvation. They want to make it more or less and then it already is. They don't want, they can't take it at face value. See, when we replace the element of believing with any other condition or combination, our witness becomes powerless. Today there is widespread confusion. Take my word for it, it's true, over what really saves people. The the, uh, the the religious community of the world has gotten people so mixed up that all roads lead to heaven. Stay with me on this. I recently read statements on salvation from several known ministries, and the only agreement among them was that something other than faith alone was required for a relationship with God. That should, that should scare you to death. A commitment of the will, a turning from sin, a surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Those, those names should, uh, uh, should bring up be- bring bells in your mind. But the result of these additions to God's one condition of believing the gospel, of trusting Christ alone as Savior, is that the, go- is that the gospel is compromised and rendered powerless tonight. Any kind of allegiance to Christ is now accepted as salvation. You know, you know what a lot of a, you know, the number, the largest church in the world is the Roman Catholic Church, obviously, and uh, <clears throat> so what a lot of these uh, uh, fly-by-night groups do is they go down into these uh, third-world countries, and they don't try to change the Catholic Church; they just add it to it. And they put it all together, and then they, they got voodoo Catholic churches, they got uh, animistic Catholic churches, and see, they just mix it all together, and just put it in a pot, and roll it all together, and then throw it all out, and you can believe anything you want to, man, and you're going to go to heaven, I'm telling you, as long as you get that money, <laughs> got to get that money, amen? So, so now, just about anything is accepted as salvation today. Folks, this is, it's, it's a fact. Listen, that's why you see Bible-believing churches that preach the gospel are, are getting fewer and fewer in, in existence. Not only that, fewer and fewer in attendance. Be, 
because we require something. We want you to serve the Lord. You know why a lot of people don't like small churches? Because the front row is the back row. And when you come in and you sit in the back row, I can see you just as well as you, if you sit where Brian is. And I can preach to you just as good from where Ed is as where Brian is. And, and I preach about service. And you find out that in a small independent Baptist church, just about everybody in there is doing something. And what happens is the people that aren't doing something, they come in and they discover that everybody's doing something but them. They don't, they don't want to stick around very long because they might have to do something. They, because they won't blend in very good. Amen. I've seen that over and over, over the years. Amen. Number two. The devil does this to, number two, distract us and delete us from our purpose. You know, there's all kinds of ministries out there today. There's the AIDS ministry. There's the uh, uh, all these different things going on. Uh, I, I heard uh, one church where they, they, they fixed cars. Uh, all they did was you brought your car down there, and they fixed cars, and they told you they loved you, and, and, and that was a great thing, amen, and, and, the, and you sent you on your way. I mean, it was the, it was a car church, <laughs> and then they got the cowboy church out. Me and my wife went to several meetings, and uh, it was a non-denominational, which I, I, I don't do very often, but we is a political thing we went to, and, and uh, there was all kinds of different preachers from all kinds of different groups, and, and <laughs> it was actually not bad, but there was a cowboy preacher there, and they come in on their horses, and they sit there, and they all worship together on their horses. I mean, I mean, there's just all kinds of weird stuff out there. I mean, it's, it's, it's to lead us and distract us from our purpose. You see, the devil has neutralized the church. Take your Bibles and go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, if you will, and look at verse 12. This is what we're supposed to be doing. This is what we need to be doing. This is what we are to be doing. It says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to teach faithful men. We're supposed to teach them and teach them how to serve the Lord. <clears throat> and then to uh, bring them up and mature the saints. And then mobilize them, make them an army, a volunteer army for God. And then send them out in service so that they can procreate and go out and find others and bring them in. And we start to process all over again. Through the teaching of the Word of God, we can help people solve their problems. Help families build strong homes. And confront the problems of society. Today there's widespread confusion over the purpose of ministry. I want to ask a second question. Why does this church exist in our community? Why do we meet together as a local body of believers? It is not so we can be entertained. It's as nice as it is. It's not so we can have all of our friends at church. They're, that's a byproduct. That just happens as you go and you fellowship with other believers of like faith. The reason God established the local church so we can come together and be matured in our faith and equipped to serve God for the building up of the body through evangelism. Maturity must lead to service, and service is what leads to evangelism. The third thing the devil wants to do to us tonight is number three. Disable us. Disable us. To impair our productivity. He has nullified our outreach. Today, we're, we are very familiar with the subject of disabilities. Amen. They make you uh, put elevators in all your two-story buildings now. They, there's no question about it. <clears throat> Everything is for disabled people. They have a, If you ever go to a, a Walmart, uh, there's the first... 75 spaces are for handicapped. I'm not kidding you, man. you got to park back on the North 40. If you're, if you're a regular guy that's not crippled, 
you have to park at the back of the parking lot, man. I'm thinking, man, how many crippled people are there? But yeah, I guess there is. I guess they need that. But, uh, <clears throat> so we're familiar with the Disabilities Act. We understand that different things, such as blindness, the crippling diseases, may cause someone to be disabled. Often we have no control over these things. Sometimes uh, people get uh, in trouble in uh, just regular car accidents. They get very mangled and hurt, and then they're disabled the rest of their life. But our enemy, Satan, deliberately puts things into our path that are meant to cripple us in our Christian walk. He wants to uh, cripple us for good, amen? He wants you to, to, to be in that, uh, in that uh, disability space, amen? Sins of neglect, uh, no Bible study, uh, sinful habits that produce guilt and bring discipline and discredit our witness. And by the way, the, the Lord, if you belong to the Lord, He will spank you. Sinful attitudes, a uh, love of money. It's also often said that if every person that needed to tithe would tithe, the missionaries would have to go around to all the churches and beg for money all the time. They would just have exactly what they needed. Amen. It's a sad thing that we have to have special meetings and special uh, stewardship times uh, to remind us of how to give, and we should just know how to do it automatically. I mean, it's I I, I don't know if I'm just an oddball or well, I probably am, but but uh, I it just never was a big deal to me. I, it was easy for me to give. I I give and give and <laughs> at least that's enough. <laughs> up there <laughs> but but uh, we we try to give as much as we can it, humanly possible amen and sometimes supernaturally possible we give even more than that and the Lord will lay it on my heart and I say well honey we just got to give some more it's just so hard why is it so hard to do why are you why is your heart not moved by a missionary by a, a man of God by a these people that need help by by families that are that are just so destitute they need help and you, you want you want to don't you just want to help people don't you just want to do the work of the Lord well I hate to say this and I know it I know it nobody wants to hear it but it sometimes takes money it sometimes takes funds to do that amen <clears throat> today there is widespread confusion over what it means to behave as a Christian. God had never intended the church to be isolated from society, but he does intend the church to be separated from secular values. Instead of, 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 of making a stand and saying, this is what we believe in the, in the, in the modern-day church, I hate to even use the word modern, but it's the truth. It's a truth. It's a good word now. Uh, that We have brought the, the, the world into the church. And now we have incorporated things of the world and make it made it part of our services, and now we're just like everybody else. We're just we are not even special anymore, amen. We're supposed to be a called out church, peculiar to the world. You know, the world sees no difference between their lifestyle and the lifestyle of the church. You know that there's no difference between the amount of of, of people that get divorced that aren't saved and those that are saved? That's a real sad one right there. We find our Christians at rock and roll concerts and at bars and and in places that they ought not to be. I see Facebook. I see you. Yeah. See you on there. Breaks my heart. I don't never say nothing. Breaks my heart. See people you know, drinking it up, having a time, and think of, think about the time back in my life when I was so far from God, drinking alcohol. No good. Dulls the mind. Mainstream uh, Christian music now is just the same as mainstream uh, secular music. And 
We can't even tell the difference. I, I was going down the road the other day, and I, I couldn't find a good southern gospel channel. I couldn't find a good bluegrass channel, and I, I ended up over on one of them K-Loves, uh, the K-Love channels, and I, was like, and I was listening to that, and I think, man, this is like being in one of them lounges at the bar years ago when I was out drinking at the bar, and they were just up there just strumming, you know, dee, 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 dee. Jesus loves you every once in a while you hear that. Oh, my goodness. Come so far away from the things of God. A people come prepared for battle. And then we get our minds in the wrong place, our bodies in the wrong places. And then the devil comes all roaring into our lives. Just like on Pearl Harbor Day and and he wrecks us. Never saw it. Wonder what just happened. Unprepared for battle. Instead of converting the world, we've been crippled by the values, philosophies, and practices of the world. Instead of trying to teach the world what's right, they have taught us what's wrong. So sad. So sad. Now, although my children are not here in this building tonight, they're in another church, independent. I thank the Lord. Not only are they in church, they're in an independent Baptist King James church somewhere where their churches are. I thank God for that tonight. We we work hard, and the, the greatest thing, the greatest gift we ever have in our whole life is our children. Man, we got to got to teach them right. We only have them for so long, and then one day, mom and dad, you're not going to be there, and they're going to have to make that choice on their own. And they may not may not make the choice that you would make. They might be a people unprepared for battle. The devil has 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 misled them. Amen. Fourthly, the devil wants to not only does he want to do all that, but number four, and it's the worst one of all, he wants to destroy us. Just to neutralize our potential. This is the ultimate desire of Satan for every church and every Christian. Like the Philistines in our text, he amasses his forces for the purpose of complete and utter destruction. The devil doesn't want to leave anything standing. He wants you to come back at all. He's not content to disarm you, to distract you, to disable you. He wants to destroy you tonight. That's why we got to keep our defenses up. And have more than one sword in the house. Hello? Hmm. Can't allow them to strip us of the power of the gospel message. Man, we're running out of time. Have you seen this travesty on television? Uh, these... Uh, People that they they got the full weight of the United States government and the whole half of the country behind them, and they're they're going just determined to take down our president. I mean, if you watch this stuff, it's just it's just pure. It's just from the the devil himself sitting in that chair right there in that Congress. I mean, the things that come out of their mouths and the things that they say, and I just I just I'm just sitting there I'm wanting to. Pull up my TV like, what? How can this even be? When enough people turn their back against God, they get disarmed. See, 50 years ago, all the Baptists and all the Pentecostals and all the really good Bible-believing people in this country, we left Public schools. We left them, and we let we let the government have them. What? The young people that are growing up today—they're a product of the school. All these uh, crazy people they were interviewing on television today—they were uh, heads of all the departments of the greatest 
uh, uh, colleges and, and universities in America, Harvard and Yale and total idiots. I'm just telling you, they were total idiots. But they believed every word they said. We have allowed the devil to have his way. We can't allow him to disarm us as individuals. We got some time left. Not much. There are some people in this church that want to come and they want to help. They want to do some things. And there, there might be some things going on in the next few weeks, next few months, next couple of years. Hopefully we'll start getting some people saved and baptized and get the bus ministry started again and, and get some young people back in this building. I don't know if you remember, I think Sylvia was here. Not all of us were here. <clears throat> but uh, when I first came, uh, we had more kids than we had adults. Remember that, Sylvia? We, uh, some of the adults would say, man, there's just too many kids in here. we got to get rid of all these kids. Now we can't even get any. Yeah, I was, people told me that. Got to get rid of all these kids. They're, they're tearing the place up. I said, well, yeah, they are. They're hearing the gospel too. And we baptized a lot of them. We got a lot of them saved. This place was a hopping. Amen. Be sober. Be vigilant. Let us not be a people unprepared for battle. Let us not be asleep at the wheel when the fighters fly overhead and start killing us. The devil's coming to kill us. We've been fortunate. We grew, we grew up in the United States of America. I don't know, there's a few years there where they were over there over in the bush and they were pretty, pretty a little bit concerned. People were getting murdered all over the place. And well, then you have a couple of churches that got uh, Turk took over and burned it to the ground, didn't they? I remember those letters. They said, pray for us. Pray for the Lord's safety. And, and, and we're going back to Sambaru to, or to or the, wherever their house is and because all the people were dying were getting kidnapped and killed. And I'm telling you, folks, you go to the third world, you'll, you'll be glad you live here. And it's, <laughs> they're catching up with us. Catching up with us. People. Unprepared for battle. We're going to come tonight. We're going to pray. I'm going to request tonight that if uh, you would particularly remember uh, Michael and Lorraine and uh, their family as they uh, go back to the bush. And uh, I know they're ready to go and they want to get back there. And it's a big deal. Pray for the Lord to hold them up with health, finances. A lot going on. A lot, a, lot, a lot of moving parts for them to do what they do. Let's pray for them tonight in a very special way. Michael and Lorraine, and they'll be with us one more service this coming Sunday. And... Uh, might be a blessing to them. Now, remember, we want to have a special offering for them. We'd love to send them off on their way with a, a good check. I would love to send them with no less than a thousand dollars in their pocket, maybe more. It'd be nice if we could do that. If we all do it together, we could do it. Uh, get the word out to those that weren't here tonight too, if you would. As you, you know, some people that might be able to be a part of that offering, that would be great. And uh, so we'll, we'll receive that offering uh, Sunday morning. Sunday morning. And they're going to be heading out Tuesday and uh, going to uh, Cincinnati Airport and then flying out, I don't know, <laughs> I think, what, 25 hours or something?
So total what? About 24, 25 hours. Plus the layover. Yes. Yeah, uh, little Hunter, uh, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a full of, full of vinegar, full of vinegar. And uh, I guess they may have to re-break his arm and recast his arm if it doesn't get back in place like they want it to. He's pretty little, so Hunter, Hunter John. All right. Let's go ahead and come. You're going to put a tape on for us now. Let's pray tonight, amen.